Tuesday. We wanted to use another question that we had received. In fact, this is the last one. Uh, the box is empty, so if you have a question to put in for uh, November, why, we'll be glad to look at it there. But uh, we want to deal with uh, the last one that we have, and it again has several parts to it. So we want to look at all of these parts this evening. It deals with worshiping in spirit. How do we worship in spirit? Does that mean with our heart and emotions? How can I make my worship more heartfelt? I feel as if I go through the motions sometimes. In order to find out an answer to that question, we want to consider how the phrase is used uh, 17 times in the Bible. I would have thought it would have been more, but uh, in spirit is only found 17 times. Uh, now maybe in the spirit or some equivalent of that might be found more often, but that's all the amount of times that we have uh, to find that. So uh, let's just take a quick run through of these. They're not difficult. And we'll start with uh, Proverbs 29 and verse 23. <clears throat> and you might say, well, why do that? Because we want a feeling for how it is ordinarily used. There's been a little bit of controversy on uh, John 4, 23 and 24, which I'll mention a little bit later. And uh, so it helps to have a sense of how it is used everywhere else in the scriptures in this case. So Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 23 says, a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. The humble in spirit, that sounds a little bit like Matthew 5, 3, doesn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And usually we say that refers to those who are humble. So we have a similar usage here in Proverbs 29, 23. And then in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 8, uh, the end of a thing is better than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So all of these are dealing with attitude, are they not? And uh, whether someone is uh, proud or humble, uh, patient or otherwise. So uh, these are a few of the times we find it. And then we find uh, a, a little bit different emphasis, but the same type of thing. We find in uh, Isaiah 54, 6, uh, these words concerning, I believe this is how God felt. Let's take a look. Uh, Isaiah 54 and verse 6 for the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife uh, when you were refused, says your God. And so we find out that one can be grieved in spirit. What does that mean? Well, does it not mean grieved within? Uh, likewise, uh, John chapter 13 and verse 21 we read concerning Jesus that when he said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And so again, this is within the inward part of man. Then backing up to uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse uh, 21, the opposite can also be the case. In Luke 10 and verse 21, in that hour Jesus rejoiced in his spirit. So your spirit can be grieved, you can be grieved within, uh, you can be troubled, you can be rejoicing. Uh, so all of these are talking about the inward uh, part of man. So now we want to go to an interesting usage, back to Isaiah uh, chapter 29 and verse 4. It contains an interesting parallelism uh, that I don't think is found elsewhere in the scriptures. And uh, let's go ahead and read the verse first and then we'll comment on it. 
Isaiah chapter 29, verse 24. Uh, These also who erred in spirit will come to understanding. And those who murmured will learn doctrine. This is a, a parallelism. Those who erred were those who complained or murmured. That's an erring in spirit. In other words, we are not to be that way. We're not to be complainers and murmurers, and we talked about that just uh, not too long ago. And again, this is called erring in spirit. That's not the kind of uh, person we ought to be. And uh, also parallel in this passage, uh, those who erred in spirit will come to understanding and they will learn doctrine. Uh, This is how you come to a correct understanding is by learning the doctrine that is uh, taught in the scriptures. Uh, Doctrine does not refer just to subjects like premillennialism or original sin. It also refers to moral issues. That also is doctrine. It also refers to one's attitude. And that also is doctrine, and that's why we read, do all things without murmuring or complaining, because those things would be to err in spirit. Now, there is one occasion, and only one, that I could find where uh, doing something in spirit referred to the Holy Spirit. This is the only one of the 17 times that we find that. And to find that, we go to Matthew 22 and verse 43. Matthew 22 and verse 43. And this again is Jesus speaking. And uh, it was on one of those occasions uh, where they were questioning him and he decided to question them back. And so he says, how then does David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is obviously referring to a section of scripture, and David said it in spirit. Now, I know the New King James has in the spirit, uh, and translators frequently do that. It's, It's not an error particularly to do that, but we do note that in the Greek, there is no the. It's just in spirit. Uh, But we don't have any objection to saying that David said it in the spirit, uh, because he did. Uh, But that's one time where we find uh, that usage only one time out of 17. Now, twice we see the phrase used of the young John in Luke 180, where he waxed strong in spirit. And we see the same thing uh, concerning Jesus in Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. He grew strong in spirit. And uh, so that we generally refer to as spiritual growth. Learning, improving, growing, maturing, having a disposition in harmony with all that God desires of us. They both grew in that way. Now in Romans chapter 12 and verse 11, it tells us not to be lagging in diligence, but to be fervent in spirit. So there's a great contrast. Lagging in diligence. What what does that mean? means you're not careful about what you're doing. It means you don't really care all that much. You ought to be diligent, but you're lagging in diligence. You have a a kind of an attitude that doesn't really care all that much. Maybe cares more than doesn't care, but certainly is not fervent in spirit, and that's a characteristic that all Christians ought to have. That is, to be receptive to spiritual things, and enthusiastically so. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. 
1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Let no one despise your youth, Paul tells Timothy, the young evangelist, but be an example to the, un, uh, to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And uh, so that's, again, one of the other usages. Now, Paul uses this phrase to refer to the inward part of man as opposed to the outward um, physical body. And in fact, he does this in uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse 3. He says, For I indeed am uh, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present concerning him who has done this deed. So he was there with them in uh, spirit, but he was not there in body. And in a sense, he does the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 34, where he says there is a difference between a wife and a virgin, and uh, the unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, but that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And so the inward person is to be holy just as the outward person is to be also. And uh, that's similar to what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 7, uh, 1, uh, that we should be uh, holy in, in body and in spirit. Uh, and you know, despise those things that are unholy regarding both of those matters. Now, those are all the times that we find the phrase in spirit used, except in John 4, 23 and 24, our scripture reading uh, for this evening. So, having seen all of the other usages, what do you think it might be here? Well, how do you think it might be meant in John 4, 23 and 24? Does it not refer to attitude, demeanor, our inner man? Certainly in John 4, 23 and 24, it doesn't relate to inspiration as we saw one example did. And so we need to consider the context of what is said here. The Samaritans may have been quite enthusiastic in their worship in their attitude, their demeanor, uh, how they express themselves. However, they needed to retain that, but also worship in truth. So they were probably heavy on the in-spirit side, on the sincerity, on their enthusiasm, but on the truth side, they, Jesus says you worship what you do not know. They were not worshiping according to truth. Uh, we have to be careful, since we have devoted so much time to truth, that we are not lax on the in-spirit part. We must be sure that our enthusiasm remains high as regards worship. I uh, heard an interesting quote on the radio uh, this morning. Uh, the band Poison was being interviewed, and I don't remember, I suppose the lead singer said this, and I immediately thought of the Samaritans in connection with this. He said, we don't always know what we're doing, but we do it with conviction. <laughs> well, isn't that what everybody does that is worshiping in spirit, but not in truth? They don't really know what they're doing, but they're doing it with conviction. Well, we need to have both, the truth and doing it with conviction. At uh, Fried Hardeman's Open Forum in what I believe was uh, 2003, Todd Deaver uh, stepped to the microphone and said concerning John 4, 23 and 24, Oh, I think that means the Holy Spirit. Yet, we did not find that definition as we looked at the, seven, uh, the other 15 passages 
We found it once referring to inspiration, but uh, Todd Deaver holds to the direct influence error, as does his father, Mac uh, Deaver, and his brother, Waylon Deaver. As with most hobbyists, everything has to pertain to the Holy Spirit. Every time they read a passage, it has to be the Holy Spirit. No, we go by context, and we let context determine the meaning of a passage. Does it refer to the heart and to the emotions? That was part of the question that was asked. Well, it certainly could include that, but we already have a passage that deals with the heart and the emotions in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart and soul and mind. We don't go park our brains somewhere. We use our minds as we're worshiping God. And strength. These deal with emotions and conviction of the matter based on truth. And so we do uh, say yes emphatically that we are to have our heart in the worship and uh, it, it can affect our emotions. Now, going through the motions, somebody said, I mean the questioner said, uh, sometimes it feels like I only go through the motions. Well, uh, that probably has happened to all of us at one time or another. And there are probably reasons for that. Uh, at least we're going through the right motions, but it's still a problem. And we need to do something about that. Maybe part of the problem is, as we come together, we're not doing anything new and different. We are essentially singing the same songs, praying for the same types of things every time we pray. We're giving the same offering. We're hearing messages that we have heard before, oftentimes. Maybe presented in a little bit different manner, but you know, a lot of what we hear is the same. Uh, there's, there's no getting around that. Uh, the Bible contains truth, and the truth is going to be the same. We just try to find different ways of presenting it sometimes. Are we too familiar so that it's becoming old hat? Is that part of our problem? Well, if we are not careful, we uh, will be influenced by these various types of things. And our worship might become automatic, even ritualistic. We know it's the truth. We know it's as God commanded it. But that may not lead to fervor or enthusiasm on our part. Perhaps that is the reason that false teachers have such a field day in the church and with brethren who have actually been taught better. But they are willing to follow in this direction uh, at times. Oftentimes, something new and different is thought to be exciting. And some do not care if it is right or wrong. That's the importance of emphasizing that worship must be in truth. Well, how do we make it more heartfelt? We must be mentally prepared. And so I want to give seven suggestions for, uh, in the, by way of answering this particular question. Number one, realize the significance of what it means to be lost and then saved from a forest or a cave you cannot find your way out of. It's not a very pleasant feeling, is it? And we must remember that we at one time were all lost. And how... Uh, Bad, that makes you feel when you know that there is something you can do, but maybe you haven't done it yet. Maybe you haven't responded yet, and so you're still lost. This is not a good feeling at all. And so we need to realize the significance of what it means to be saved. 
each and every time we come together for worship, we should have this kind of thought in our mind, uh, this kind of attitude concerning uh, why we are meeting uh, together. So that's number one. Number two, consider how we need to be enthusiastic, not only for our, by the way, don't be overly enthusiastic. Uh, just a, a good, modest amount of enthusiasm would be fine. Uh, we should not uh, be enthusiastic only for ourselves, but for the sake of visitors who come among us. Would you want to be part of a group that is dull and going through the motions? We must fully participate in what we are doing. Number three, consider the privilege of being part of the redeemed, the body of Christ, the church planned from eternity by God for us to be part of that great body of Christ. As we oftentimes tell children, um, you don't uh, get, uh, you don't have to go to church. You know, oftentimes children ask that question. We tell them you get to go to church. And those who get to go and love to go are enjoying the blessings or will enjoy the blessings of heaven and eternal life. Um, and won't we be learning new songs constantly in heaven? I mean, I don't know if, you know, one day somebody's going to come out and say, today we're going to sing Yiddish. Uh, uh, there's a lot of languages. There's a lot of things. There are a lot of songs written. You know, as you look uh, at some of the people who have written songs in the songbook, uh, some of them have maybe written 100 to 200 hymns, and we only have one or two. There's a lot of songs that we've never even heard of. And uh, I don't imagine we're going to be singing the same song every day in heaven. But there are hundreds and thousands to choose from. Heaven is better and even more glorious than anything we have experienced here on earth. Number four, worship leaders should be prepared. Worship leaders should be prepared prepared because God's people deserve the best they can to lead them in worship. They deserve the best efforts on the part of the leadership uh, to uh, guide and lead their worship. And so this is something I, I, I know uh, sometimes I've seen in time past where uh, and I'm not talking of here at all, but I've seen in various places people who were not prepared to teach a class, people who were not prepared to lead songs, uh, people who hadn't given much thought to what they were praying for. We need to be prepared to lead God's people. Otherwise, it's just going to lead to going through the motions uh, that much more. Then number five, members should be prepared. And that begins on Saturday evening by being asleep at a reasonable hour. Now, I know a lot of things can happen. Uh, you can uh, wake up ill during the night. Uh, you could wake up and, and not uh, feel like sleeping. Uh, but if you're planning on staying up till 2 or 3 in the morning, you, you have defeated probably your responsible participation in worship the next day. One needs the appropriate amount of rest. Now, you don't always get what you plan, but you can plan it so that you're not taking a lot of time uh, finding it hard to get up in the morning. Uh, and not being alert during worship, and not being on time to worship. Worshiping Almighty God is not the same as preparing for a casual brunch. We need to be prepared when we come to worship. Be on time for Bible study, followed by the worship, so that we're able to enter into it in a good way, and it doesn't become 
just going through the motions. Don't be sleepy, grumpy, dopey, or one of the other seven dwarfs. Read the lesson. Be prepared to discuss the, the class, the, the, the Bible study. And again, we get to go. It's a privilege and it's an honor to be present with God's people to worship Almighty God. Number six, concentrate. Don't be distracted by people moving about. There are always going to be people who have to leave uh, the assembly for a few minutes. Uh, that's always going to happen. Don't be distracted by the noise of children. Uh, thank God that you have children here uh, and that they are making sounds because children are going to do that. Uh, that. That's just something, you know, that's the way it is. So we try not to be distracted overly by those things. Uh, try not to be distracted by feeling uh, poorly, and that's often the case, or worries uh, that may be on your mind about things uh, as they are. All of these things we need to try to put aside as we enter into our worship of God. Now let me just say something about the problem of familiarity. Concerning that problem, do you love your husband? Do you love your wife? How long has that been going on? 10 years? 20 years? 30 years? Are you going uh, through your marriage in a rote manner? Are you just going through the motions? Or do you find ways to show love constantly and demonstrate love? Well, if we can do that in a marriage, we can do that for God. We shouldn't just say these things are familiar. We need to make them fresh and new all over again. There are many things that we can uh, do. Uh, one of the uh, things I do during the Lord's Supper so that it doesn't just become a ritual is uh, to think about, first of all, what was said in uh, the way of preparation for the Lord's Supper. But also, I, I think about the events themselves as Jesus went through them at that time. I think about the sayings, the seven sayings of Jesus while he was on the cross sometimes. And just take one of them and think through it. Think of all the things that are uh, going along with that. What does it imply? Uh, what is stated, what is not stated. Uh, just this morning I was thinking, you know what? Those first three things are about other people. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's thinking about others, his enemies, who put him on the cross. Then he said, uh, behold your mother and behold your son. He was thinking about his mother. And then the third thing he said was uh, to the thief, uh, who had repented, today you shall be with me in paradise. Then the other four things pertain to himself. There are always new things that you can think of. Uh, while we're praying, while we're meditating, there are always things that you can find that are going to make it real and uh, uh, meaningful to us. But we have to put in the effort in order to get the benefit from that. So these are seven things that uh, will help in making worship not just going through the motions. This evening, if you have never obeyed the gospel, we invite you to come if you've already studied what you need to do. And uh, we want to encourage you to obey, to repent of your sins, because as we talked about, you, you're lost. And that is not a good feeling, especially when there is a way out. Can you imagine somebody being in a cave and uh, no lights and feeling around the walls? And somebody says, here, I have a light. Follow the light. And the person in the cave says, no, I'll just keep going on my own. I'd be uh, going as fast as I could to get to that light. Well, Jesus is the light. And he is shining, and people need to go to the Lord. And if you have not, you can do it any time that you are ready 
You do need to repent of sins, confess that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and then be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are already a child of God, uh, I pray that you will think about some of these principles tonight uh, because we don't want to just be going through the motions. And if we can help you spiritually in any respect, let us know this evening while we stand.